So, as a part of this discussion, let's take a look at few of the habits of systems thinking. We will discuss two habits each with two examples. The first two habits that we are going to look at are seeking to understand the big picture. Now, what does this mean? A systems thinker focuses on the big picture and not just only on the details. He or she needs to be good at both and not just get caught in the details. Now, the questions to ask for a systems thinker in this context are, how do you maintain the balance between the details and the overall objective or picture? And how much time should one take to understand the large system? And the third question is, focus on what one can influence and not focus on what one cannot influence. So these are the three main aspects while understanding this habit. Now it'll, these things would get clearer as we discuss an example. To begin with, to illustrate this specific habit, let me go to an example of rainwater harvesting that I personally experienced uh, in my own apartment in the 90s. The situation back then, the population wasn't as much as it is now in terms of density and the surroundings and environment were a lot more conducive for rainwater harvesting. We were staying in a place where there was sandy soil and uh, the effects of rain and harnessing it could be immediately seen after a, a few rounds of rainfall. It would reflect in the quality of the water, improved quality of water from the wells. Back then also, the city was facing a lot of water shortages from an individual household supply perspective. But when we, one looked at the overall rainfall on the city, it was much more than what was needed for the city. Hence, town planners and the government started advocating rainwater harvesting because a lot of the surface water rain was just getting and getting mixed with the drains and uh, was not being usefully used and the government also brought in a policy to mandate houses and apartments to implement rainwater harvesting and for those who did that it gave very good results so this was the situation back in the 90s now how does it correlate to the big systems thinking uh, big picture thinking as we took a look at the previous habit where we tried explaining it would be very easy to get caught in saying that i don't have sufficient supply in my apartment the government has to be blamed or the government might be saying other things instead of that the larger picture that was seen was the city was getting adequate rainfall which was sufficient for all its population but at the individual apartment supply level it was not being able to cater because there was a lot of loss in the surface runoffs so by looking at both the details as well as the big picture this policy of rainwater harvesting was formulated and this was a small time activity which individually the apartments could take up. This comes under the area of influence too. So it satisfies all the criteria that this systems thinking habit prescribes. Now let's look at the next habit in terms of what elements have changed in the system and what changes are happening over a period of time and how quickly they are or slowly they are increasing or decreasing and what patterns and trends are emerging over a period of time. To take a look at it in the same context of rainwater harvesting as experienced by us in our apartment, I will walk you through the current situation or the situation that happened over the last two decades. Now back then in our apartment there was uh, sandy soil all around the apartment. There was a lot of surface area where uh, sandy soil was there. But gradually, with affordability, with improved economic conditions, 
a lot more people started buying cars and uh, almost everybody has a car in the apartment and with time there was also a need for uh, paved apartment pathways around the apartment which resulted in construction of cemented pathways this had an unexpected effect although in hindsight we can correlate with it but at the time of doing people didn't think the aspect related to water harvesting the surface area of the soil that was available was far lesser apart from this uh, happening within the apartment in and around the apartment there was a lot of uh, construction a lot more houses concretized houses came with uh, some of the slum de dwellers embarking on uh, concrete houses and then with the affordability also comes the uh, increased use of washing machines and therefore a lot more water that gets discharged the water salinity also has changed at the groundwater level over a period of time what used to be relatively sweet water available with uh, within a few 30 feet now um, even with a lot more depth the water saltiness continues to remain the growth of population the usage of water and several other factors resulted in many of these things happening and at the city level also the drainage uh, with with a lot of urbanization the drainage which was working efficiently about uh, 15 to 20 years back started frequently facing problems with a lot of drainage overloads and overflows recently we had a situation where the drainage pipe overflow uh, got mixed with the main line now these are unfortunate happenings but these represent the things that one can understand then one needs to be aware of over a period of time a lot of good lessons were learned by us so the one time rainwater harvesting that we did since situations keep changing in several aspects it's not a one time thing any longer it needs continuous monitoring revision and also a monitoring of the related systems it is also important that everybody understands the overall dynamics and not just one person because although the factors listed are a few these are fairly complex factors too getting people to understand that it's an integrated system not just within the apartment but in the surroundings also is a very big challenge and uh, a lot of times sometimes uh, we don't have control over what happens within the apartment although to some extent it can be regulated by rules but it's far more complex to influence or control what happens around the apartment in the nearby streets the larger uncontrollable uh, aspect is the overall city drainage water extraction ability while the governments might be doing their best given the high growth and population with the reduced land surface area with a, a lot of crowded uh, localities that is also posing a strain on the system so we could see that and newer solutions improvised solutions need to be given in order for the single rainwater harvesting system to work efficiently we'll go to the understanding of the next two habits through the another example now because systems are complex and there are so many parameters and variables it is often difficult to quickly see results on a large scale now how do we make progress in complex systems and uh, how do we monitor it systematically looking into the different aspects of the system now how do we also understand and assess what other aspects of the system does this uh, change influence so it's a iterative process and uh, we'll get to see again uh, this and another correlated habit we'll get to see an illustration through another example a very related another systems uh, here we look at how do the past experience influence my theories my assumptions how well does my theory or model match or differ from other views and systems and when considering an action do i and those i work with ask what if questions if i touch something what would happen who else would be impacted what else would change 
This correlation and interrelated questions are very key to ask while practicing these habits. An example of both of these, now we all know that cities have grown big and they continue to grow bigger and there is a lot of economic growth and activity and specifically for large companies and uh, let me choose the example of IT companies but this could apply to any sector where the workforce doesn't have to necessarily physically come to office. Now let's go back about 2-3 years. Even then there was a large growth scene. Uh, I am specifically looking at the era where the pandemic had not started. The traffic and commute challenges were there for every employee. Let's take a company that is situated fairly at a distance from the main city. Uh, typically involving a 15 to 20 kilometer commute on an average which would take a one to one and a half hours. From an employee perspective, the traffic and commute were a challenge going to and fro. From a company perspective, they were facing challenges of where to exactly build the offices because they couldn't be built within the city for obvious reasons of lack of availability and also the high cost. And the third thing the company had to keep in mind was where is the talent available, right? They need to mix and uh, find out where the right talent is available so that it's not too much detrimental for them that uh, they cannot uh, uh, look out uh, uh, keeping the factors of uh, cost in a city uh, where the talent pool availability is not there. So they had to mix and match all of these. These challenges kind of existed earlier. Now let's take a look at the changes that brought in, that were brought in because of the pandemic. Pandemic forced a lot of staff in fact almost all of them to work from home in fact it was a change in the mindset of the company management too that they had to all of us had to embrace be it be whether you are a part of the company management or whether you are a part whether you are a part of the workforce we all needed to learn how to work from home and there were initial challenges and struggles but over a period of time both the company as well as the employees adapted well so over a period of I would say roughly two years, I would say a lot more acceptance and adaptation happened wherever the work did not need a physical presence. I am not talking about a shop floor or a factory, I am talking more about tech and tech related work which could be done using a laptop, a Wi-Fi and a mobile. Now let us take a look at the dynamics post pandemic. The companies and the employees are facing a new kind of a situation here. On the one hand, while the pandemic brought its challenges, it solved the problem of commute and traffic. It all from an employee perspective because they were able to manage from home. From a company perspective, managing a huge office with the cost of rentals with the ability of the employees to work from home, it was like a boon allowing the employees to continue to work from the home even post the pandemic. Is it the comfort zone? Is it the norm and the way ahead? Because during the pandemic, it was a forced uh, work from home, but it did have its related challenges in terms of employees not meeting each other, the personal bonding and rapport that cannot be replaced by working through uh, remote mechanisms and also the monitoring of the work done by the employees and the team members was less than efficient as felt by some of the managers as opposed to uh, working in a physical office. Now how does one balance the comfort of providing employees the benefit of uh, not commuting as much yet at the same time having to meet them and work with them in a closed environment. How does one manage, manage and monitor employee sincerity? Because while most part of the workforce is sincere, there could be those people who could be taking advantage of working remotely and pursuing their own work. Now, is it a good thing to have freedom or is it not a good thing? Is a dilemma that is there in the minds of organizations. Now, if they force employees to come back to work, they are on the one hand they are facing the challenge of um, again increased commute time 
a little less of freedom that the employees had been used to over the last two years? Would that be affecting the employee morale? That's some factor, that's something that the employee management has to factor in. Now, this is where the two habits come in beautifully. The managements are now in the process of doing successive approximations and surfacing and testing assumptions. Okay, what if we allow the employees to work from home for the most part, but let's say make them come to office twice a week? This would be a good balance between their having the freedom and yet having some kind of a personal rapport. Another option they are thinking of is what if we provide them rental facilities like workstations closer to their homes and split the teams across different parts of the cities. These, not, these need not be full-fledged owned office premises but workstation rentals that the large companies could take up in different parts of the city. Now, different kinds of these models are already being tested, results observed, fine-tuned and uh, a gradual balance between complete freedom and complete uh, online and balancing uh, with the personal rapport and physical presence is being iterated. Over a period of time, we will find that the hybrid model of working with part online and part offline will be the way to sustain. But what will really help them experiment and be successful at it depends on these two habits. How do we look for progress? How do we test our assumptions? These are the two systems thinking habits that the workforce managers need to have for them to really figure out the right working model for their company. Hope these examples helped you understand and correlate the various different habits of a systems thinker in the real life context. Thank you.